Chapter 9 Saturday lives in my memory as a hot, humid day of suspense. I had slept little and rose early. I went into my garden before breakfast and stood listening, but towards the common there was nothing stirring but a lark. The milkman came as usual. I heard the rattle of his chariot and I went round to the side gate to ask the latest news. He told me that during the night the Martians had been surrounded by troops and that guns were expected. They aren't to be killed, said the milkman, if that can possibly be avoided. Then I heard a train running towards Woking. I saw my neighbour gardening, chatted with him for a time and then strolled into breakfast. It was a most unexceptional morning. My neighbour was of the opinion that the troops would be able to capture or to destroy the Martians during the day. It's a pity they make themselves so unapproachable, he said. It would be curious to know how they live on another planet. We might learn a thing or two. After breakfast, I decided to walk down towards the common. Under the railway bridge, I found a group of soldiers. They told me no one was allowed over the canal. I talked with these soldiers for a time. I told them of my sight of the Martians on the previous evening. None of them had seen the Martians, and they had but the vaguest ideas of them, so they plied me with questions. After a while, I left them and went on to the railway station to get as many morning papers as I could. I did not succeed in getting a glimpse of the common. Horschel and Chobham church towers were in the hands of the military authorities. I heard for the first time from Marshall, the tobacconist, that his son was among the dead on the common. I got back to lunch about two, very tired. The day was extremely hot and dull. I took a cold bath in the afternoon. About half past four, I went up to the railway station to get an evening paper, but there was little I didn't know. The Martians did not show an inch of themselves. They seemed busy in their pit. I must confess the sight of all of this armament, all this preparation, greatly excited me. Something of my schoolboy dreams of battle and heroism came back. It hardly seemed a fair fight to me at the time. They seemed helpless in that pit of theirs. About three o'clock, there began the thud of a gun at measured intervals from Chertsey or Alderston. I learned that the smouldering pine wood into which the second cylinder had fallen was being shelled. It was only about five, however, that a field gun was ready for use against the first body of Martians. About six in the evening, as I sat at tea with my wife in the summer house, talking about the coming battle, I heard a muffled detonation from the common. Immediately after, there was firing. Then came a violent, rattling crash, quite close to us, that shook the ground. Walking out onto the lawn, I saw the tops of the trees about the Oriental College burst into smoky red flame and the tower of the little church beside it slide down into ruin. One of our chimneys cracked as if a shot had hit it. A piece of it came clattering down the tiles and made a heap of broken red fragments upon the flower bed by my study window. I and my wife stood amazed. Then I realised that the crest of Maybury Hill must now be within range of the Martian heat ray. At that, I gripped my wife's arm and without ceremony, ran her out into the road. We can't possibly stay here, I said. And as I spoke, the firing reopened for a moment upon the common. But where are we to go? Said my wife in terror. I thought, perplexed. Then I remembered her cousins at Leatherhead. Leatherhead, 
I shouted above the sudden noise. She looked away from me, downhill. The people were coming out of their houses, astonished. How are we to get to Leatherhead? She said. Down the hill, I saw soldiers ride under the railway bridge. Three galloped through the open gates of the Oriental College. Two others dismounted and began running from house to house. The sun, shining through the smoke that drove up from the tops of the trees, seemed blood red and threw an unfamiliar lurid light upon everything. Stop here, said I. You are safe here. I started off at once for the spotted dog, for I knew the landlord had a horse and cart he sometimes hired out. I found him in his bar, quite unaware of what was going on behind his house. A man stood with his back to me, talking to him. I must have a pound, said the landlord, and I've no one to drive it. I'll give you two, said I, over the stranger's shoulder. What for? And I'll bring it back by midnight, I said. Lord, said the landlord, what's the hurry? What's going on now? I explained hastily that I had to leave my home and paid for the cart there and then. I drove the cart off down the road, back to my wife. I then rushed into my house and packed a few valuables. The beech trees below the house were burning while I did this, and the palings up the road glowed red. One of the soldiers came running up. He was going from house to house, warning people to leave. He was going on as I came out of my front door, lugging my treasure, done up in a tablecloth. I jumped up into the driver's seat beside my wife. In another moment, we were clear of the smoke and noise and riding down the opposite slope of Maybury Hill towards Old Woking. In front was a quiet, sunny landscape, a wheat field ahead on either side of the road and the Maybury Inn with its swinging sign. I saw the doctor's cart ahead of me at the bottom of the hill, I turned my head to look at the hillside I was leaving. Thick streamers of black smoke, shot with threads of red fire, were driving up into the still air and throwing dark shadows upon the green treetops eastward. The smoke already extended far away to the east and west. The road was dotted with people running towards us and very faint now, but very distinct through the hot, quiet air was the sound of machine gun and the intermittent crackling of rifles. Apparently, the Martians were setting fire to everything within range of their heat ray. I am not an expert driver, and I had immediately to turn my attention to the horse. When I looked back again, the second hill had hidden the black smoke. I slashed the horse and raced away from working. Chapter 10 Leatherhead is about 12 miles from Maybury. The heavy fighting that had broken out while we were driving down Maybury Hill ceased as abruptly as it began, leaving the evening very peaceful and still. We got to Leatherhead without misadventure about nine o'clock. The horse had an hour's rest while I took supper with my cousins and left my wife to their care. My wife was curiously silent throughout the drive. She seemed oppressed with forebodings of evil. Had it not been for my promise to return the horse and cart to the innkeeper, she would, I think, have urged me to stay with her in Leatherhead. Would that I had. Her face, I remember, was very white as we parted. For my own part, I had been feverishly excited all day. Something very like war fever had got into my blood. It was nearly eleven when I started to return. The night was unexpectedly dark to me, walking out of the lighted passage of my cousin's house. It was as hot 
and close as the day. Overhead, the clouds were driving fast, albeit not a breath stirred the shrubs about us. My wife stood in the light of the doorway and watched me until I jumped up into the cart. Then, abruptly, she turned and went in. I was a little depressed at first with the contagion of my wife's fears, but very soon my thoughts reverted to the Martians. As I came through Oakham, I saw along the western horizon a blood-red glow, which, as I drew nearer, crept slowly up the sky. The clouds of gathering thunderstorm mingled there with masses of black and red smoke. Ripley Street was deserted, and except for a lighted window or so, the village showed no sign of life. As I ascended the little hill beyond Pyford Church, the glare came into view again. The trees about me shivered. I heard midnight peeling out from Pyford Church behind me. The silhouette of Maybury Hill, with its treetops and roofs, black was sharp against the red. A lurid green glare lit the road about me and showed the distant woods towards Alderston. I felt a tug at the reins. I saw a thread of green fire suddenly pierce the clouds falling into the field to my left. It was the third falling star. Thunder burst like a rocket overhead. The horse took the bit between his teeth and bolted down towards the foot of Maybury Hill. And down this we clattered. Once the lightning had begun, it went on in a rapid succession of flashes. The thunderclaps sounded like a gigantic electric machine. The flickering light was blinding and confusing as I drove down the slope. Something was moving rapidly down the opposite slope of Maybury Hill. At first I took it for the wet roof of a house, but one flash following another showed it to be in swift rolling movement. And this thing I saw, how can I describe it? A monstrous tripod, higher than many houses, striding over the young pine trees and smashing them aside. A walking engine of glittering metal, ropes of steel dangling from it. Then suddenly the trees in the pine wood ahead of me were parted. A second huge tripod appeared, rushing as it seemed, headlong towards me, and I was galloping hard to meet it. At the sight of the second monster, my nerve went altogether. Not stopping to look again, I wrenched the horse's head hard round to the right, and in another movement, the cart had heeled over upon the horse. The shaft smashed noisily, and I was flung sideways and fell heavily into a shallow pool of water. I crawled out almost immediately and crouched, my feet still in the water, under a clump of firs. The horse lay motionless. His neck was broken, poor brute. And by the lightning flashes, I saw the black bulk of the overturned cart and the silhouette of the wheel still spinning slowly. In another moment, the colossal mechanism went striding by me and passed uphill towards Pyreford. Seen nearer, the thing was incredibly strange. It had long, flexible, glittering tentacles, one of which gripped a young pine tree, swinging and rattling about its strange body. Behind the main body was a huge mass of white metal, like a gigantic fisherman's basket. Puffs of green smoke squirted out from the joints of the limbs as the monster swept by me. And in an instant, it was gone. In another minute, it was with its companion 
half a mile away, stooping over something in the field. I have no doubt this thing in the field was the third of the ten cylinders they had fired at us from Mars. For some minutes I lay there in the rain and darkness, watching by the intermittent light these monstrous beings of metal moving about in the distance over the hedge tops. I was soaked with hail above and puddle water below. It was some time before my blank astonishment would let me struggle up the bank to a drier position or think at all of my imminent peril. Not far from me was a little one-roomed squatter's hut of wood surrounded by a patch of potato garden. I struggled to my feet at last and, crouching and making use of every chance of cover, I made a run for this. I hammered at the door, but I could not make the people hear, if there were any people inside. After a time I desisted and, availing myself of a ditch for the greater part of the way, succeeded in crawling, unobserved by these monstrous machines, into the pine woods towards Maybury. Under cover of this, I pushed on, wet and shivering now, towards my own house. I walked among the trees, trying to find the footpath. It was very dark indeed in the wood, for the lightning was now becoming infrequent, and the hail, which was pouring down in a torrent, fell in columns through the gaps in the heavy foliage. If I had fully realised the meaning of all the things I had seen, I should have immediately gone back to rejoin my wife at Leatherhead. But that night the strangeness of things about me and my physical wretchedness prevented me. I was bruised, weary, wet to the skin, deafened and blinded by the storm. I had a vague idea of going on to my own house. I staggered through the trees, fell into a ditch and bruised my knee. Finally, I reached the lane that ran down from the college arms. There in the darkness, a man blundered into me and sent me reading back. He gave a cry of terror, sprang sideways and rushed on before I could gather my wits sufficiently to speak to him. I went close up to the fence on the left and worked my way along its palings. Near the top, I stumbled upon something soft and by a flash of lightning, saw between my feet a heap of black broadcloth and a pair of boots. Before I could distinguish clearly how the man lay, the flicker of light had passed. I stood over him, waiting for the next flash. When it came, I saw that he was a sturdy man, cheaply but not shabbily dressed. His head was bent under his body and he lay crumpled up close to the fence as though he had been flung violently against it. I had never before touched a dead body. I stooped and turned him over to feel for his heart. He was quite dead. Apparently, his neck had been broken. The lightning flashed for a third time and his face leaped upon me. I sprang to my feet. It was the landlord of the spotted dog. I stepped over him gingerly and pushed on up the hill. I made my way by the police station and the college arms towards my own house. Nothing was burning on the hillside, though from the common there still came a red glare. I let myself in with my latch key, closed, locked and bolted the door. My imagination was full of those striding metallic monsters and of the dead body smashed against the fence. I crouched at the foot of the staircase with my back to the wall shivering violently.